So, Mitch briefly introduced himself. Why don't we just go on around the room and let you brief all introduce your, your, yourselves. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm a third year at the college, majoring in political science. I want to say uh, maybe 30, 45 seconds worth, a little bit more, um, or okay. a minute, yeah. Um, and I'm, although we're, we'll, we'll, that is, we'll go around and, and talk more extensively, but just a little bit more background. Okay, um, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I currently work at State Senator Kwame Rule's office um, as like an interim special project manager. Uh, what else do you guys want to know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, we, we talked about me. modeling political mm -hmm. behavior, and there's a bit in the Scenescapes book, which we're focusing on more generally, but lots of stuff in the new political culture. We have six or seven books on, on how and why the dynamics of political order, or organization are changing, and that in turn is what led to scenes. So just one sentence or two. We basically found that the old model of socialism in the 19th century, of the New Deal coalition, was sort of the rich versus the poor, the high versus the low, and that that was breaking down into multiple dimensions. One was still income, occupation, class in that sense. But I did a 10-year series of conferences with Seymour Martin Lipsa, which was called, hello. Hello. Uh, please join us, Martha. And, um, and, and we found then that the <coughs> social issues were breaking away from the, from the traditional class, income um, kinds of issues. The environment, women, human rights, were becoming more and more salient in the U.S. and Western Europe first, a little later in Southern Europe and Latin America, and increasingly now in, in other, other, parts, other parts of the world. Okay, so then, then we found sort of the next big step was the rise of consumption and entertainment politics, led by, not by political scientists, led by mayors often, mayors, civic groups, because they were responding to what citizens were finding, whether it was hip hop, rock, which they would identify and join with, or Bill Clinton would, would go to Hollywood, would perform himself, et cetera. Um, and so <coughs> Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were, 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 were clear examples of this. We have a reaction now against some of that with, with, the, with the, I mean, most obviously, the so-called new populist leaders. Uh, Trump, Macron, uh, the Brexit movement in England, etc. So the, the reactions against this social liberalism of tolerating especially new immigrants has generated a counter reaction and so we have these multiple new, new movements that don't fit the traditional 19th century or class politics kinds of cleavages. But that's the background for scenes. And so scenes in that sense uh, have been featured initially, we, we focused more on the, on the political, the organizational, because mayors were often trying to take credit for this or in, a place, or in places like much of the world, especially the US, Western Europe, much, say Italy. Italy, I think, has the lowest birth rate in, of the European countries. Um, they've got a negative growth, in, or China, China. I mean, China had a one-child policy and, and so the population is going down, and now people say, well, maybe we can have more children. Okay, so, so China illustrates the same kind of, kind of thing in the sense that, that these, um, these dramatic, so, so in China, it's, it, it's a, maybe, a, okay, I won't try to go into the subtleties <laughs> of, of, of China in one sentence, but, but basically these social issues are becoming more and more salient. And they tend to be, we have five or six different dimensions, but one is issue specificity. They're not comprehensive. They don't, women, young, highly educated, Catholics, don't all consistently support the same thing. They're, they're each different kinds of social backgrounds, and these issues are then, have some of their own, their own separation. And some point, some, one way to put it is, is, is about 10 to 15 percent of the variation in voting or in support for the environment or in feminism is explained by race and class, occupation and gender and national origin like Polish or Mexican or, or, or whatever. 80 percent is not explained by those characteristics and no one usually tells you that. They say, oh, you know, race is everything you know, and, and so forth or class is everything or gender is everything. 
But the, look at the social science papers on this in, in economics, political science, social science, sociology journals, and they show, they look for the adjusted R squared statistic of all of them put together, and it's about 10 or 15. Okay. So we need more. That is, things are changing. We need new social science models because the world is changing, and it's changing often led by mayors. At the local level, this, is, this, is, this was happening long before it happened at the national level. So we had populist local leaders that we wrote about, and we called them initially new fiscal populists. And then 10 years later, we had Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. So we saw these kinds of people and wrote about them in the, in the, um, in the, in, in the NPC books uh, years before. And, and uh, people laughed at me. I said, there's a taxpayer's revolt going on. <laughs> How can that be? You know, government is growing. You know, there, there's no taxpayers' revolt. And my answer was, half of the cities are cutting back on their local expenditures and taxes. Half the cities in the U.S. And that started in 1974. That was four years before Proposition 13 uh, in California, which was 78. That was it was Reagan was 1980. So Reagan did not cause the taxpayers' revolt. The taxpayers' revolt caused Reagan. And so making that point is what we then have been pursuing now, that the, the causality is often reversed from what people have normally thought about because still today, most Americans, most Europeans still think of classic neo-Marxist, rich, poor kinds of politics. And it explains some, but it, there's a lot which it does not. So most people are confused and angry when they talk about Trump or these other things, and that's why we've been we have a draft paper on Trump to try to, 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 to be, and, and we, had, we had sessions on populist leaders in, in Montreal. Okay, so that's the long, long introduction because it's not just you. That this, 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 this is new stuff to some others too. All right, why don't we keep going? Okay. My name is Mu Yangshu and I'm a graduate student from MAPS program <laughs> focusing on sociology and I'm interested in cultural and political sociology. And you did an MA on? On, on political rebellion in hip hop in China. Okay. Yeah. And it was terrific. And you worked, we worked on it for eight months, something like that. Uh, and it got better and better and better. So congratulations. Thank you. Then you sent a, a little application, and I saw at the top skills. Research design, research interest, cultural sociology. Then reports, quantitative and qualitative methods, interviews, questionnaires, surveys, multi-level modeling. And I said, ah, that's what we need help on right now, multi-level modeling. Because I'm not an expert. No, no, but you sent me some examples. You have done some very good things. Have, have you had a course on, on something? Yeah. What was the course? The name is multi-level modeling. So it was here? Yeah. Uh, who, who taught it? Um, so Steve, oh is, 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 is Stephen Robinbush? Uh, no, it's in the public health. Public department. health. Yeah. Uh, but not K Kate Cagney? No, not Kate. So, okay, so, no, so, 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 someone else, not, not Kate Cagney. Okay, so not a sociologist. Uh, no. Okay, no, no, that's fine. That is, this is now a new method, very widespread in especially social science. And it, it starts from the, just a, a word on why we care about this. We have data for our Trump paper at the zip code level and at the county level. If you do ordinary least squares regression, the idea the, the is, or simple cross tabulations, you can get some misleading results, or potentially. And so the multi-level analysis includes both of those levels, and if you have a third level like individual voters or national voting, you can have two, three, four, five levels. And then multi-level analysis looks at the dynamics at each level and properly estimates the, the matrix of relations among them. And we have hypotheses of this sort in the paper. But because ordinary least squares is simpler, we ran everything in ordinary least squares. But as I reread re it, I said, you know, we're gonna be hit by the reviewers. We better do this with multi-level analysis now and then submit the paper with that for publication. And so that's where we are, and we will turn to you shortly. <laughs> okay, all right, why don't we, we have three Chinese in a row. You wanna speak about your backgrounds, folks? Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone, I'm uh, Chrissy Ryo. I'm from China. I'm a business student here for almost one year, and I'll go back to 
China and September yeah. and I'm very interested in the uh, urban innovation or cultural public, um, public policy and I'm very honored to participate in the translation program of series written by Professor Yang and uh, now I'm just a collector. It's coming out in Chinese in a couple of months so thank you. Is, uh, is about the uh, uh, urban space, how to develop the, uh, or how to um, improve the... P PhD, yeah. yeah. Okay. Urban, uh, urban innovation ability. And, yeah. and now I'm collecting almost 40 cities data around this area. Okay, so, so you've, you've, you've got neighborhoods in Beijing and you've got various types of cultural scenes in the US that you've analyzed for dimensions and types and models of examples of kinds of scenes. So in that sense it's an interest it's a new form of cross national work that doesn't try to be large scale quantitative but draws on the on the elements of um, of um, types of scenes which which we're eagerly looking forward to translation into English. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, I'm Xiang Xunye, a visiting scholar from Beijing, China, and I have uh, studied at Chicago um, the University for almost one year, and I will leave Chicago <laughs> at the end of August. Um, today, I want to express my thanks to Professor. Thanks for your introduction, uh, instruction and uh, help to me. Um, and I would like to continue to conduct the research on the theory of things and the public service delivery. And I would like to communicate with you by email. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank you much. So you've been working on, in a sense, productivity of service delivery, which is more organizational analysis using hospitals, other kinds of public public policies, and where and how they can they can benefit from a more holistic feeling analysis of the parts, and not just focus on as a sur most surgeons do. I want to cut this out, and you'll be better. But the hospital the art on the wall, the antibiotics, the nurses, the treatment, the ambulance, uh, the health insurance, etc., and how those things variously transform the quality of, of, of service delivery. Okay, so we've had a number of people in earlier years with local governments comparing service deliveries like, um, no, 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 pass these around. Um, <laughs> There, there was a guy, and it's a really an earlier, earlier version. Was uh, Rowan Miranda was very active on these these issues at a company called Accenture, which worked on on uh, it's a consulting firm which works on on uh, productivity improvement. Okay. Hey. <laughs> All right. Hey guys, uh, my name is Luis Quinones. I'm a uh, well, technically a second year uh, grad student at SSA um, in the uh, social administration track. Uh, I want to focus on community organizing and development. That's pretty much my focus. And um, I'm interning at the Metropolitan Planning Council come October, working on their segregation project. Uh, I'm a self-proclaimed agitator, so you always see me at like protests and <laughs> reading political stuff or posting on Facebook and getting the stuff moving. Um, what else can I say? I do have an arts background. I went to performing high school, performing arts high school, and um, it really helped me. Develop my art and really get the scene going. So that's why I'm interested in how art can change communities and organize in a political way. Terrific. Now the Metropolitan Planning Council was started by really by a guy named Ferdinand Kramer in the in the forties, who I, I, I worked with very, very actively for a number of years. He was he was chairman of the board of Draper and Kramer and he, he really helped develop the, the whole the whole South Side, that is the, 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 the fastest growing zip code in the United States in terms of economic development, is the area just south of the Loop, and, that's, and it's the north end of Bronzeville where, 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 where I live. And, then, and the first big project then was Prairie Shores, where, 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 where I now live, in part because of the, of the, res, the legacy of, of uh, Ferd Kramer. So, so the Metropolitan Planning Council uh, is one of the, if not the leading sort of 
big civic organization in Chicago that, that, that has foundation funding, that has many of the top <coughs> civic groups that come together and talk about things which are important for Chicago. And, and the, biggest, the biggest political issue in, in many ways in the US and, and much of the world is segregation along ethnic, uh, especially ethnic, ethnic lines. Sometimes people talk more about class in the European context, but in the US it's mostly eth eth ethnic traditions. But, but you come from Florida, and uh, what are your quick reactions? So you've been here how long from Florida? Uh, a few months. A few uh, months. I started in June. What are your quick reactions to the differences between Florida and Chicago? Uh, the weather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can tell the segregation here. I was born in Philadelphia, so segregation in Philadelphia is pretty bad too. But compared to Florida, segregation in Chicago is, you can see it, like crossing the street. You can see, I live in um, Little Village, which is mostly a Mexican neighborhood. And um, you can tell, you cross a bridge, you're already in um, Edgewood, I think it's where it's called. You're in the north side. And so you can tell, I think, more here, the whole segregation part. You heard the name Robert Vargas? He, had, he, he did a PhD, now a book on Little Village. And he shows, there, mm -hmm. you, you, you know about it? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And he shows the two ends of Little Village are dramatically different. One has sort of coordination by the aldermen and the civic groups are well funded, he supports them, they work together and they work with the gangs and the gangs support him politically. The other section is divided, it's gerrymandered into multiple constituencies, I think three or four different aldermen and they fight each other and the gangs fight each other, the civic groups don't get funded and the murder rates are terrible. Mm -hmm. So within the same so-called community area, you've got two dramatically different kinds of things going on. So he's identified these, he's interviewed, he's got lots of data, and now he's looking at, at the ways that things like political, so what he's really trying to do is add politics to the gang and crime equations that most people, most especially economists, sociologists, leave out the political part. But the, but the little village is a powerful example of how gerrymandering and, and coming, you come from Miami. Miami was created as a metropolitan area in part to prevent some of the suburbs from developing strong ethnic Cuban and other uh, identities and political leaderships. And so in that sense, I mean, that there are only really two major, two major metro areas in the, in the, in the U.S. are Indianapolis and, and, and Miami. And, and so Indianapolis is more of a good government, let's all work together. Miami was sort of, you know, we don't want these people developing separate poli politics and so let's, let's uh, bring them in. But then the numbers of uh, cu cu Cubans, mm -hmm. others transformed. So now there's, there's, a, a, there's, there's been cu Cuban leadership there for, there, there for some. Y your background is, is well, I'm not supposed to ask, but, uh, but, but you're st you've studied more the Mexican context, I gather. I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, Puerto Rican. Oh, so okay, okay. I lived in Central Florida, okay. and which is Kissimmee, that area where Disney okay. is. Okay. And we have a huge influx of Puerto Ricans coming in because of Hurricane Maria. Okay. And Kissimmee is like the capital of Puerto Rico. Sure, sure. sure. So um, that's what I've been mostly studying on the housing area. Okay. All right. Well, the, I'll just add as well. I've been doing well. Chicago is the most studied city in the world. Uh, when Harold Washington w won the primary, the Democratic Party primary, I, I called up his campaign manager, Bill Grimshaw, and said, Bill, this is the most studied city in the world. Harold Washington is very strong. This is going to change all of the politics and all the books written about Chicago. You should really, and Bill was, uh, he was also chairman of the Social Science Department at IIT. You really ought to write, you ought to, you ought to work on this for, for a book. He said, Terry, I'm too busy. I know. Okay, I called him back a month later and said, Bill, this, this is major, major stuff. You really, really, really ought to work on it. He said, well, I'll do it on one condition. I said, what's that? That you do it with me. So we worked together for about 15 years on an oral history of Chicago's transformation after Harold Washington, and the number one issue was race. So race, segregation, how it's variously linked to politics, and, uh, and I'll, I'll just mention that one of my talented former students is named Tony Preckwinkle, who's now president of the Cook County Board, who was early the, earlier the alderman here in the, Hyde, in the Hyde Park area going up through Bronzeville. And we've had a series of students do internships with her, and first in the, in, in the 
neighborhood area, then as then an al alderman, and now as, as Cook, Cook, Cook County president of the board. Um, and she, she had twice the support among the citizens of Chicago if she would run for mayor in the last election, but she didn't run for mayor. So Rahm Emanuel did not have, have a majority vote. The alderman from the strong side, the strong end of Little Village, had something like 38%, Rahm Emanuel was maybe 25%, Rahm Emanuel had maybe 20, 26%, so they had to have a runoff election, and then Rahm Emanuel won. So the point is, if Tony Preckwinkle had won, she would have been elected mayor in the first round like that. But she's, she stayed president of the Cook County Board, and, and, and she also is the person who brought Barack Obama into, his, into, in, into politics. So she's, a, she's, she's talented. Okay, but, but her, her politics are completely contradictory with the traditions of the Chicago machine. She's been fighting the machine ever since, ever since she began. Okay, um, let's push on. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm making the point if it's not clear. The scenes dynamics and scenes were created by mayors often for political reasons and therefore the policy linkages with scenes and scenescapes and these kinds of political dynamics which we're talking about as well with or around civic groups can be very important such as in hip-hop music so you studied the lyrics of hip-hop and you found what was the difference between the u.s and china most dramatically so the chinese hip-hop talks less about political issues mm -hmm. and um it seems like they don't care about political issues, but not they are not there to say political uh, rebellion. Because I found several songs that express very explicitly their rebellion against uh, the government or the policies. But done in a in a more subtle way, not in the lyrics themselves. Um, or that is, how many of the listeners could tell that that was happening? I think it, it was done in a very explicit way. Explicit way, yeah. okay, okay. So they were the exception, and they're still performing. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, all right. Um, excellent, all right. Yes, uh, next. I'm Kim Kim Liu, a visiting student of, uh, in Department of Economics. My research area is uh, labor economics. Um, my my research area is very close to prof uh, Professor the Club, so my advisor, John Crowley, introduced me to Professor the Club. So I want to tell you a good news. Uh, I get the, uh, I get the uh, accept letter for my first English paper when I come in on the board. Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. So uh, in fact, I think I work hard during this year when I'm in Chicago. When I, I, when I was in, when I, I'm in University of Chicago, so I think the the paper, uh, the published paper is a good result for me. Uh, so uh, I think I'm very happy for this result. So before I live live here, uh, I will uh, I will leave. Uh, uh, at the end of August as well as uh, as well. So uh, thanks. I want to say thank you to Professor the Club. So thank you. Let me let me just add briefly the background. I mean, you're studying. Just tell us briefly your topic. Yeah, your PhD oh, topic. Okay. Uh, I want uh, my research area is labor economics. My topic about my first English paper is: Would you like to live the largest city, such as Beijing, Shanghai, or Shenzhen in China? I do a uh, empirical analysis about this phenomenon. Uh, so uh, uh, the result is, mm, if you go to the bigger city, uh, you will get more about uh, more fifty percent than to other cities. P or, uh, pay higher pay. Yeah, higher pay. Okay. Yeah. So this is a it's very significant effect for the migrant. So I. Uh, Estimate the effect and to uh, to uh, talk about the uh, talk about the some political uh, policies of government. Uh, to uh, I want to uh, tell tell everybody if you want to earn more money, maybe you could go to the 
largest city, if you um, but the largest uh, but the uh, threshold of the largest city is very high now. So uh, maybe you could go to a second largest uh, second category largest city uh, largest cities to uh, get a high level of happiness. I think maybe it's an important thing. So uh, that's my take. And my second English paper, in fact, I finished my second English paper, but George Tully asked me to change more, so I couldn't finish it until now. Uh, but I will change, uh, I will uh, finish it when I, uh, when I come back to China. Okay, George Tully and I have been working together for decades, many decades. Yeah. I mean, he, as an economist, saw what many non-economists had seen decades back, that people don't go for things just for pay. They also like clean air, oh, and yeah. the air is not so clean in much yeah. of China, but it varies. And so how much is clean air worth in money that people will give up to get cleaner air, either as an individual or through their government, is a, is a, kind of, is a big, hot, is a major policy question for China. And Trump is Trump. You know the Trump policies have changed from Obama. This is a it's hot. So, clean air is one obvious amenity. What is an amenity? The economists define an amenity as a non-market good or service. So you do not pay through the market, but you get the clean air even if you don't pay any oh, tax or anything. I see. And so, so we in, and so the economists have studied amenities for 20 years, starting especially here at Chicago. And Tully was Tully was one of the first. Uh, then the major finding, which most of the Chicago economists had, was if you want to, if you want cleaner air, you will be willing to pay for it by taking a job which pays you a lower salary. So the idea is, and the, fi the finding was, in many American cities, the biggest cities, or the, and the, let's say the cities with the cleaner air, tend to pay less. So where and why the positive relationship you're finding is different in China from other places is a big issue to explore. And so is it because the salaries are set in a standard way by the government and they're more and the greater socialist controls are still doing this or would would the same pattern hold for private within China there are also many private firms do they have yeah. to follow the same pattern does it hold is you know, if you go below the very top level these are the kinds of questions which are which are asked and which we're now we're now exploring. There's a there's a new uh, George and I have a new have a new series of exchanges just in the last two years, and we're we're now collaborating with a new guy who I'll, I'll mention to to Martin in a, in a second, or I'll mention his name now. His name is Douglas Noonan, and and Martin may remember his name because he provided he collected data on arts districts or historic districts. Yeah, I guess I, I don't think we got the arts districts from him. The, the, the historic districts I think we got from, from, from him. Uh, and um, he published a paper on it, which was a fairly descriptive paper. And so we, we worked with a student working on an MA on this, and the tentative finding was the historic districts had no impact on economic development. Okay, so Noonan um, uh, it worked. He did a PhD here in the Harris School. He's now a professor at Indiana University, and I, I met with him about two weeks ago, and found he has a new paper where he finds the opposite, namely that historic individual historic um, historic um, sites, I guess they're called, a house, uh, the White House, you know, George Washington's home. The uh, you know the the Monadnock building in Chicago, the first skyscraper, and so forth. These kinds of things add value. Um, at the same time that the district does not seem to do so. So looking at each of these using multi-level analysis at the county, the city, and the and the site, I think he's got he has a use of the importance of multi-level dynamics illustrated in ways that we can we can learn from in a new unpublished paper. So 
So he and I and George are meeting again next week to talk about how we, how we may, may continue to collaborate along these kinds of lines. But the point I'm making is that what you're looking at in China is internationally important and controversial, and you can contribute to international research in the US and Europe by reading and, and, and communicating with these issues. Okay, I okay. guess you're reading it. Because okay. my listening is, uh, is improved, so okay. I get to what you said. Okay, so if you look at the video when you came here in, in September, October, I said the same thing, okay. but you didn't understand it so okay. <laughs> But you're now understanding it more. Thank yeah, you. And, and, it's, and we'd be glad to continue as these things get sharpened uh, each time. Okay. Um, next. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim uh, Bunce. <laughs> uh, my name is Jim Bunce. I was uh, born in Miami, Florida. I grew up in South Florida. Um, went to school in Pennsylvania, went to school in New York. Uh, most recently, I was working for uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, as a historic preservation specialist. And I, um, I just got to uh, University of Chicago three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, uh, graduate student with the Graham School. Okay, great. So, uh, hi, I'm Ryan Morgan. I'm brand new here um, as well to the Scenes Project and to the university. Um, I am uh, going into my first year at the uh, Harris School, um, Master of Public Policy program. Um, I come from uh, a background um, in transportation, urban planning. Um, I am rec recently moved here from, uh, from Brooklyn, New York. Um, for that, um, I, uh, I got my undergraduate degree at Columbia. Um, so I've been a New Yorker for, for some time. Um, I also worked um, in transportation in, in Philadelphia as well. Um, I guess my interests center around um, you know, government, public policy, urban policy, um, you know, and, and urban innovation, um, and how all those issues intersect. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Martha? I'm Martha Frisch. I'm a faculty member at the School of the Art Institute in Historic Preservation. Um, Professor Clark and I have been collaborating for a couple of years now on scenes and the historic environments in which scenes happen. We published a paper last, a couple months ago, and I'm continuing to work on this exhibit. And the, and the paper, just for at least two people, two or three people overlap? Um, I'm trying to think of the was exact it, was title. Called, was it called the Oxford Handbook of, of Historic? Heritage Theory and Method. Heritage Theory and Method. Okay. And it was basically an introduction to the idea of um, heritage and scenescapes okay. and what effect a historic area would have on scenescapes. So, so it's a work in progress. But to look at the relationship between an individual, that is, the economists make an easy assumption of, of ad hoc, caterus paribus, everything else being equal. It's atomistic in that it ignores the surroundings, and it assumes that you can properly model or at least theorize about it, and they, they built bigger, better theories by doing that. However, empirically, when you get to a neighborhood or a, an entire city, it has a range and a, and a set of historic sites, music, weather, humidity, crime, and uh, ethnic conflict, politics, and how all of these come together is what we try to capture more with scenes, and then to look at the relationship between these and how, for instance, as uh, Moretti, who has, has, has put it in, in, in his book, if you get a haircut in a small town like Waco, Texas, it may cost $2.50, or it used to. You get the same thing in Hollywood, and it may cost $200.50. Okay, so what is there about a haircut in Hollywood that leads to the same, same? We don't know if it's the same haircut or not, but the price is very different, depending on the scene. 
So looking even at prices, so even if you get paid more, if you have to pay $250 for a haircut in Beijing, you may let your hair grow long, okay? But cost of living, have you adjusted for cost of living? Uh, no, I, I will address, uh, maybe okay. I will address another people about okay. the... No, but, uh, but in yeah. your PhD, all you need is one variable. You don't need a whole paper. You just, you know, <laughs> yeah. throw in cost of living in a regression and see yeah, how much that deflates, yeah, for instance, okay. Uh, don't need a sociologist to tell you that, but any, anyway, okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so we've gone around the room. This is great. Oh, we missed, we missed Pumar, who's there on, uh, on her screen. Would you like to talk to us? Yeah, wave on the screen. Maybe you can, you can, you know, you've, have you been pointed around to everybody? Or? Yeah, maybe. I think I've seen everybody's faces. Okay, great. So tell us about your background, please. Okay, very good. All right, what do we have? Let me see. What am I doing wrong here? There we go. Um, getting to, we usually at this point try to get to something more concrete and specific that we're in the middle of working on. And we have, there were two people who I thought might join us, but they're not, avail they're not available now. And um, what when, what we well we don't have in the the the, uh, the way we, we work we work with with people is not to have we don't have a formal organization we don't have slots we don't have pay fixed pay rates and job job definitions although we had to had have something to to help help us find each other. But what we try to do is talk with each of you and get enough of a sense of what your interests are, your skills, and combinations of skills, so that we can we can say, you know, what 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 might you try out, and then and then try out maybe two or three different things for a bit, uh, in conjunction with uh, thinking about how these could extend our work on on scenes. So some of you have had two three courses on scenes, others have had none. And so if you've had none, reading becomes more critical at the beginning to get a feel for what, 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 what we're talking about when we talk about the scene. Um, and so I, I, don't, have a, I, I don't, don't have a single copy in my office, so I'm passing around two other books we did in the last, last couple of years. Um, the background is basically is this, that is, Can Tocqueville Karaoke, the, the deliberate title, is how might music like singing karaoke in Asia be an analog to civic participation in the West. So if the, if the foundation of the American democracy, which Tuckville pointed to in American say yes, 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 is civic activities, the legitimacy of the government built through participation of average individuals, how does that change if you go to Asia, where they have a more collective, communal, hierarchical, but also works family, and work structure, and after work, traditionally in China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, North Korea, etc., people go and eat together, drink together, and then when they're sufficiently fed and drunk, they sing songs about each other, and they sing their favorite songs, and so they, and then then when they when okay, etc. So where and how does this work as a counterpart? And but second, the big finding from a Korean PhD was. Civic participation does not work in Korea. If citizens participate more in civic organizations, they do not build more legitimacy through that participation, like the West. And the, by the West, we mean Northern Europe and the US. Southern Europe, it's a little weaker. Latin America, it's a little weaker. Um, 
and Latin America has generally the lowest participation rates of much of the world. Latin America, maybe may, may Africa, but we don't, we don't have so much, so much good data in Africa, but the, the, the lack of trust in, 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 in uh, Latin America is, is overwhelming. Um, so we held a series of conferences, especially with Asians leading to this book, to try to see, uh, that is one more piece, which is the, the one of the leading theorists of, of um, both civic participation and the arts is Paul DiMaggio at Princeton. And he worked with the data on the National Endowment for the Arts for 10 or 15 years, and he continually showed a decline of the arts in the US, that fewer and fewer Americans were going to concerts, going to museums, um, and, and he argued that as people are aging, whatever, we have more, more widespread uh, disinterest in the arts. Okay, that led to a review of, of art, American arts policy about 10 years ago, eight years ago, I think it was. And Rocco Landesman, who was a Broadway music producer, appointed by Obama, said, maybe we should close some theaters, maybe we should close some museums if people aren't going to them. And that, that outcry, no, 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 led the NEA to say, maybe our research is wrong. So they did, they commissioned a series of other studies and one of our, our very talented people from here was in the Harris School at the time. She was a first year student, she was a, uh, she's a dancer, she's now a sociology professor at Northwestern. And, and, and she found um, um, uh, Jennifer Novak uh, uh, found that in her study for the NEA, if you look at gospel, hip hop, rock, uh, knitting, making blankets together, you find per not just listening, but participation in the arts is, is active for about 70 plus percent of Americans, whereas if you take the benchmarks that they used to use, it's, it's in the 20 percent. So instead of 25 percent, it's 70 something percent. Because you expand the definition of the arts and you look at how these are working, and these may therefore be working in a way that's closer to what Tocqueville, who's dancing on the cover of the book, was talking about if you look at music as well as, uh, he talked about making log, putting logs together to make fences in Massachusetts. Okay, and, but especially he talked about churches. So the churches are the, are the, are the quintessential American, American institution. All right, does this work in Korea? No, so the PhD here, studied Korean organizations, national sample surveys, if you and it found some people participate more, some people to participate less. And I'll ask next, how about Ohio? So if, we, so if we, we, we have civic participation rates vary, those Koreans who participated more have no difference in trust. If you adjust for the number of people there they trust and who they know very closely personally. So they trust their sisters, their brothers, and their aunts but they don't trust the mayor, they don't trust the policeman, they don't trust the newspapers, uh, and, and, and so forth. Or that is, the level of trust is, is moderate only, and it does not increase among those Koreans who participate more, uh, uh, in, in, in the mo especially in the most important civic organization in Korea, which is what it was in 19th century America, churches. So churches are very important in Korea, politically and, and, and socially. Okay, so then, then uh, we have a, the second theme is from Jane Jacobs, architect, urban planner, who basically said citizen participation is what we need, like Tuckville. We need it for cities, we need it for architecture, we want to do what citizens want, we don't want to have just Robert Moses, a big developer planner and the head of the Greater New York Authority, um, telling us what we want. and. Therefore, we will fight him. And we should have small buildings and we should have neighborhood activities and those will hold down crime. We'll build trust through eyes on the street, one of her big concepts. And so, Martha, tell us about your Jane, your Jane Jacobs hat. <laughs> My Jane Jacobs hat is I started, there's a global effort to have something called Jane Jacobs Walks around the world. and. I was the person who decided that Chicago had to have a Jane Jacobs walk. Um, and so I ran that in Chicago for five years. 
and it was held on the first weekend in May to celebrate Jane's birthday. Um, and we did walks around different neighborhoods in Chicago. And I've now kind of moved away from doing that. But I do.